Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In this episode, I want to talk about weapons and arms. Russia is the second largest weapons exporter in the world. They supply equipment to 66 countries. 66. They have technical deals with 85 countries. Put together, Russia makes up 20% of the global arms trade. Total income, almost $46 billion. Inside Russia, the defense industry is extremely powerful. It employs 2 million people. That's almost 2.7% of Russia's labor force. And right now, they're laser focused on one thing, beating Ukraine. Most of the production is calibrated to battlefield requirements. The result is this, exports are lagging behind, especially in Africa. It is one of the biggest markets for Russian arms. Algeria makes up 15% of Russia's sales. Egypt makes up 11%. Ethiopia, Nigeria, Mali, all these countries get weapons from Russia. That trade could now be in jeopardy. U.S. officials believe Russian deliveries will be delayed, that their production capacity has fallen considerably. Western sanctions are making it impossible for Russia to acquire parts like guidance systems, like microchips or trackers. These are usually bought from outside. And without them, Russia cannot manufacture weapons. So African countries are looking for options. And why not? Defense is, after all, a buyer's market. And every buyer wants to check two boxes. One is quick and seamless delivery. The second is maintenance and repairs. Can Russia guarantee those in the middle of a war? That is a big question. We are already hearing reports of delays, like the S-400 missile systems, the one that India bought. India was supposed to get the second S-400 shipment this year, but reports say it has been delayed. Another example is the Sukhoi Checkmate. It was supposed to be a fifth generation fighter jet, Russia's reply to America's F-35 jets. Production was scheduled to begin in 2025, but now it has been pushed back. The Sukhoi Checkmate will begin production in 2027. None of this bodes well for Russia's defense industry. It may not be a paper tiger like the West claims, but it's also not the world-conquering successor to the Soviet Red Army. President Putin stated that Russia is now ready to offer technologically advanced weapons to all of its allies. And that drew a lot of criticism because a lot of commentators have stated that what's going on in Ukraine right now is the worst possible advertisement for Russian arms that they've ever seen. Because Russia's advance and Russia's progress has been far slower than expected. And some commentators are putting this down to the quality of the Russian arms. So in today's episode, I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at which countries are the largest exporters of arms. And spoiler alert here, it's the USA and Russia. We'll then have a look at which countries are the biggest buyers. We'll talk about President Putin's statement and the response that's come from the Western world. And then I'll discuss exactly why this is important. Why does Russia need to keep selling arms to the rest of the world? And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think the implications of all of this are for Russia and the rest of the world. This table shows the countries that spent the most on military in 2020. The USA was the largest spender at $778 billion, which ties in with the fact that the US is the largest economy in the world. China came in at number two, spending $252 billion. And again, this links to China's position economically, as it's the second largest economy. China also has the largest population in the world, just over $1.4 billion, and a very large landmass. India came in at number three, spending 73 billion, which is slightly surprising in terms of the fact that India is actually ranked at number six economically, but it does have the second largest population in the world, and it's situated in an area where there is a lot of conflict. So defense spending is obviously a priority for India, and they are spending slightly more than their economic position. Russia was the fourth largest spender on military, spending $62 billion. And from an economic point of view, Russia is out of kilter. It's actually the 11th largest economy in the world, but that is likely to fall because of the sanctions that have been applied as a result of the Ukraine war. GDP is falling in Russia and it's likely that they will fall out of the top 20. The UK was the fifth largest spender, investing around 59 billion. And that ties in with the fact that the UK is the fifth largest economy in the world. Saudi Arabia is number six on the list, investing 58 billion. And Saudi Arabia is actually ranked at number 20 in terms of the economies of the world. But it's situated in the Middle East, which again is an area where there's a lot of tension. And because the country has a lot of oil, it's obviously focusing on its defense spending. Germany and France came in equal seventh, spending around 53 billion. 
Japan was ninth on the list, investing around 49 billion. And Japan is actually the third largest economy in the world at the moment. South Korea was ranked at number 10 in terms of military spending, investing 46 billion. And that's exactly in line with South Korea's economic ranking. And Italy came in at number 11 on the list with an investment of around 29 billion. This table shows a breakdown of Russia's military spending in the period since the breakup of the Soviet Union. And you can see that over the last 25 years, there has been a significant increase in the amount of investment in military spend. And a lot of this increase is related to specific conflicts that Russia has got involved in. In the early part of the 1990s, Russia was involved in the first Chechen war. And the second Chechen war started in 1999 and ran for a period of 10 years. Now, I think what's really interesting about this chart is that between 2010 and 2014, there was a ramping up of military spend from around $50 billion to $81 billion. And this was in the period just prior to Russia's invasion of Crimea. Following the invasion of Crimea, military spending fell to around $65 million and has stayed at or around that level since then. Now, obviously, military spend does not equate to revenue. To earn revenue from arms, you need to sell those arms to other countries. And this table shows the top 25 exporters of major arms over the last 10-year period. And the table split into two five-year segments, the period between 2012 and 2016 and 2017 to 2021. Now, as you probably would have expected, the top two countries exporting arms over the last 10 years are the USA and Russia. But what's really interesting to note is that in the five years up to 2016, the US held a market share of around 32% and Russia had a share of 24%. In the following five-year period up until 2021, the US's market share increased by 7% to 39%, while Russia's share fell by 5% to 19%. So there's now a significant difference between the two countries. In 2016, the US held around a third of the market and Russia held around a quarter of the market. Today, the US holds almost 40% and Russia are less than 20%. And in order to get an understanding as to why that's happened, let's have a look at who they're selling to. The three biggest countries that the US sold to were Saudi Arabia, which accounted for around 23% of all of their sales in the last five years, Australia, which accounted for 9%, and South Korea, which accounted for 7%. Russia's biggest customers were India, which accounted for 28%, China, 21%, and Egypt, 13%. So if we refer back to the table we've just looked at, which shows which countries are investing the most in military, China are ranked at number two, and India are ranked at number three. However, Russia's total sales have fallen during that period, and their market share has gone down. So that indicates that China and India are buying from multiple countries, because they're not spending the majority of their budget with Russia. This table shows the largest importers of major arms over the last 10 years. And you can see that, interestingly, India is ranked at number one, Saudi Arabia number two, Egypt number three, Australia four, China comes in at number five on the list, Qatar six, South Korea seven, Pakistan eight, UAE nine, and Japan ten. And if we look over on the right hand side at which countries these nations are buying their arms from, India's biggest supplier is Russia, followed by France and the USA. Saudi Arabia's biggest supplier is the USA, France, and the UK. Egypt's biggest supplier is Russia, then France and Italy. Australia's biggest supplier, USA, Spain and Switzerland. China's biggest supplier is Russia, followed by France and Ukraine. Qatar is buying the majority of its arms from the USA, as is South Korea. Pakistan's buying most of its equipment from China. The UAE is buying from the USA, as is Japan. So what this table shows is that although China is the second biggest spender on military, it's actually making some of its own equipment. So it's not buying in all of the arms, and therefore that's one of the reasons why Russia's percentage of the global market has gone down. This chart provides a breakdown of the revenue earned by country from Russian arms sales between 2016 and 2020. And this shows that Russia's biggest customer was India, who bought around 6.6 .6 billion of equipment. China came in at number two with 5.1 billion. Algeria was number three at 4.2 billion, Egypt number four at 3.3 billion, Vietnam number five at 1.7 billion. Next on the list were Kazakhstan and Iraq, who both bought around 1.2 billion each. Belarus came in next at 0.7 billion, and then after that we've got Angola, Iran, 
Armenia, Turkey, Bangladesh, Syria, Serbia and Pakistan. Now, in terms of what weapons and systems are earning the most revenue for Russia, by far the largest category is aircraft. Fighter jets brought in around $14 billion in the period between 2016 and 2020. Engines related to those aircraft, though this is more of an after-sales market to keep those planes flying, brought in around $3.7 billion. Missile systems, $3.6 billion. Armoured vehicles, $2.8 billion. Air defence systems, $2 billion and military ships 1.5 billion. Дружественными, по-настоящему доверительными связями с государствами Латинской Америки, Азии, Африки. Готовы предложить союзникам и партнерам самые современные виды вооружений от стрелкового до бронетехники и артиллерии, боевой авиации и беспилотных летательных аппаратов. Мы намерены активно развивать кооперационные связи для создания новых образцов вооружений и техники, работать вместе на справедливых, равноправных условиях. During the course of the speech, he went on to say that Russia's offer included high-precision weapons and robotics, many of which are years or maybe decades ahead of their foreign counterparts. And in terms of tactical and technical characteristics, they are significantly superior to them. In response to these statements, Western military analysts said Russia's struggles against a much smaller adversary in Ukraine could undermine Putin's sales pitch. A senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies at King's College London stated with the collapse of economic relations with the West, Russia is even more dependent on the arms trade than it was before. So it's not surprising that Putin is keen to promote them to as many non-Western countries as he can. The big problem for him is that Russia's war against Ukraine has been a disaster for Russian military credibility. Their performance has been a very poor advertisement for their weapons. When asked which Russian weapon systems had performed worse than Ukraine, retired US General Ben Hodges cited assessments by US defense officials that Russia was suffering failure rates as high as 60% for some of its precision-guided missiles. I'd be very concerned as a prospective buyer about the quality of the equipment and the ability of the Russian Federation industry to sustain it. So why is the export of arms important to Russia? Well, this is an industry that relies upon volume. If you're going to develop new systems and new weapons, it's really expensive to do this. You have to invest a lot of time and energy and research and development. And then to get the production cost down, you need to produce large volumes. So Russia can't develop and build its own military equipment just for its own uses because it would be incredibly expensive to do that. So when it's developing new fighter jets and new ships and new missile systems, it needs to be able to sell those systems to the rest of the world to be able to bring the cost down and subsidize their own investment. So that's why Russia really need to keep these sales going. Arms and weapons are a very specialist product. And obviously you can test individual items, but if you're a country that wants to buy in military equipment, you want to know that those weapons will perform in the field and that they will be accurate and do everything that they're meant to do. And what's happening right now is a really bad advertisement for Russian weapons because the reports that we're seeing on a daily basis from Ukraine are that Russia is failing in its military exercises, that it's had a lot of failure rate on a lot of its equipment. And the bottom line on the whole invasion is that it hasn't been anywhere near as successful as Russia was intending. When it first started, Russia tried to take Kyiv and they were looking to take the whole of Ukraine. And they failed in that offensive and part of this has been put down to the equipment. So in terms of future revenue and orders from its customers, Russia has not performed well in the field and this could have a really big detrimental impact to Russia going forward because if it doesn't get those orders then that means that those programs won't be funded and subsidized and therefore the development of new weapons will be either more expensive or just not feasible from Russia's point of view. So it could get to a situation where without those orders it isn't able to develop new technology and new weapons despite what President Putin is saying about being decades ahead of everybody else. The proof of the pudding of what's happening in Ukraine right now doesn't really point to that as being true. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to make this video because I think it's interesting looking at the economic side of weapons. So I'm not looking at how devastating these weapons are and how they perform in the field. I'm looking at Russia being a business that's selling weapons to other countries. And as you saw from the tables that we looked at, over the last 10 years, Russia has been the second largest supplier of arms in the world. 
but their position has been gradually reducing. So they went from holding market share of around 25% to less than 20%. And that's despite the fact that their biggest customers are some of the biggest spenders on military in the world. So if I was looking at the situation as an analyst and I was looking at the USA and Russia as suppliers, the fact that the US market share has gone from 32 to 39% and Russia's has dropped from 24 to 19% would tell me that the products are not going down well with the customers. Generally, if you've got an increasing market share, it means that everybody likes your products and they want to buy more of them. If you've got a decreasing market share, then it's usually the opposite. People don't like your products and therefore they don't want to buy more of them. They want to buy from your competitor. And that looks like the situation right now. It looks like Russia's military and artillery offerings are not going down well with its biggest customer base. So it's losing ground against the USA. And it's really interesting that President Putin has come out and said that he believes that the military offering is decades ahead of everybody else because if it was, then they should be doing very well in Ukraine. If they had weaponry that was 10 years in advance of what Ukraine have got, then clearly they should be winning the war. But that isn't the situation. What we've seen is a very long, drawn-out affair. And Russia, which is far larger than Ukraine, is struggling to make significant movements on a weekly basis. So I think the overall summary here is that from a revenue point of view, Russia has been losing ground against the USA. And given what's going on right now in Ukraine, it's likely that that will continue. And this is coming at a bad time for Russia because the last thing they need right now is another fall in revenue. They're already sanctioned on a number of different fronts. So financially, they're facing a lot of challenges. So they would have wanted to try and increase the exports to all of their friendly countries. And in addition to losing ground, they've also lost a lot of military equipment over the course of this war. You've seen the videos of tanks that have been blown up and all sorts of other equipment that's been abandoned. So Russia will need to replenish its own supplies. And the best way of doing that is to get in some large orders from other people and then double down on the amount that you're making. So if you get an order for 20,000 AK-7 Kalashnikovs, it's just as easy to make 40,000 of those and keep 20,000 of them for yourself. But obviously, if you're not getting those orders, in order to make 20,000 more Kalashnikovs for yourself, it's going to cost a lot more money. So this is really bad news for Russia, both from a revenue point of view and also from an arms point of view. So the overall summary here is that despite what President Putin has said, and despite the claims about being decades ahead of everybody else, it doesn't really look like that's playing out in terms of the sales that Russia are achieving or what's going on in Ukraine right now. So if Russia and America were businesses and you were trying to decide which of them to invest your money into, as it sits right now, the USA looks a much better bet. Its market share is increasing, it's spending a lot of money on military itself, and it doesn't have any negative reputation. Russia, unfortunately, has got a shrinking market share and its reputation has been shot, excuse the pun. So hopefully you found today's video useful, informative and educational. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.